Good evening. Welcome to the QCIS channel. On this channel, you get a daily dose of science, technology, engineering, and math. My name is Leon Jones, and this evening, I'm going to get back into some traffic safety. And I'm going to talk about the purpose concrete barriers. Now, if you're not familiar of what a concrete barrier is, you're driving down an interstate or even a U.S. highway or a state highway. Now, you know, a lot of your highways that were made had grass medians. Now, the grass median had a ditch. And that ditch was for the cars that they ran off the road from the left shoulder. They would go into the ditch instead of hitting on coming traffic. Now, back in the 60s, in the 70s, the states of New York and California tested some barrier. It was curved, and it was known as Jersey Barrier. So what you see in the highways, that wall, specs call for the walls to be about four feet high. They're precast with concrete. Now, they have different types of barriers. They have aluminum barriers, and if you're doing construction, particularly if you're adding a lane just to keep cars from getting into the work zone, you see a lot of barrier. Well, that's what Jersey barrier is. Now, let me share my screen, and let's get into the basics of concrete barriers. Now, of course, I will... Put the link to this information at the bottom of my video. Uh, this is from the Federal Highway Administration, Basics of Concrete Barriers. And this is by Charles F. Uh, McDevitt. He's a structural engineer. Now, the basics of concrete barriers. Let's talk about the principal basics. Well, they're not generally known or understood. Now, concrete barriers appear to be simple and uncomplicated, but in reality, they are sophisticated safety devices, just like guardrails. Well, when we deal with these barriers, they have shapes. Well, when most people think of concrete barriers, they think of the New Jersey concrete safety shape barrier, or we call them Jersey barriers, NJ shape, now, for more common shallow angle hits, the NJ shape is intended to minimize sheet metal damage by allowing the vehicle tires to ride up on a lower slope face. Again, the shape is intended to minimize sheet metal damage by allowing the vehicle tires to ride up on the lower slope face. Now, also, something you need to know, a lot of bridges, they have something similar to Jersey Bears, known as parapets. And this is what the shapes look like. They're curved. Now, for higher impact angles, the NJ shape is actually a multi-stage barrier. The front bumper impacts the upper slope face and the sides upwards. This interaction initiates lifting of the vehicle. Now, if the bumper is relatively weak, the front end starts to crash before any uplift occurs. Then as the vehicle becomes more nearly parallel with the barrier, the wheel contacts the lower slope face. Now, here's what happens. Most of the additional lift of the vehicle is caused by the lower slope face compressing the front suspension. Now, however, the wheel side scrubbing forces provide some additional lift, particularly if the barrier face is rough. Now, therefore, exposed aggregate and other rough surface finishes should be avoided. Now, modern vehicles have relatively short distances between the bumper and the wheel. As a result, bumper contact is followed almost immediately 
by wheel contact. So basically, it is necessary to lift the vehicles enough to reduce the friction between the tires and the paved surface. Now, this aids in banking and redirecting the vehicle. So, what all of this is saying is this. If the vehicle is, is lifted too high in the air, it may yaw, pitch, or roll, which can cause a vehicle to roll over when the wheels come in contact with the ground again. So, preferably, concrete safety shape barriers should be adjacent to the paved surface so the wheels cannot dig into the soil and cause the vehicle to overturn. Now, years ago, it was common practice to form a 10-inch radius at the intersection of the two sloping surfaces to facilitate slip forming the barrier. The radius today is no longer necessary for slip forming because modern slip forming machines can readily slip form concrete barriers up to 52 inches in height without a radius. Now the three inch vertical reveal at the base of the barrier is only intended to provide a neat line for asphalt resurfacing. The vertical reveal makes very little change in the vehicle dynamics because it has about the same effect as hitting a 75 millimeter or three inch curve. And a curb is, when they talk about the curb, a three inch reveal. Now, drainage openings in the face of the reveal do not have a significant effect on an impacting vehicle. So higher openings should not be used because wheels and bumpers cannot interact with them, snagging and causing the vehicle to yaw. Now, whenever possible, drainage should be collected along the toe of the barrier because a drainage depression or curve out in front of a concrete shape can cause vehicle instability and lead to rollover. Now, this is what the barrier looks like. It's basically 52 inches high, a foot wide, and 32 and a quarter inches wide. And this is from the New Jersey Turnpike Authority. This is where the name Jersey Barrier came from. Now, if you look at this barrier, you see these L's. That's the concrete rebar because these are concrete barriers made with rebar. Now, the key design parameter for a safety-shaped profile is the distance from the ground to the slope break point because this determines how much suspension will be compressed. Now, for the NJ shape, the distance is 13 inches. Now, the old General Motors shape or GM shape had a distance of 15 inches from the ground to the slope break point. Now, the higher distance caused excessive lifting of the small cars of the 1970s, such as the Chevrolet Vega, after impacting the GM shape and crash test. Now, these small cars became unstable and tended to roll over. So basically, as a result, the use of the GM shape was discontinued. And after that, well, parametric study systematically varying the parameters of various profile configurations that were labeled A through F showed that F performed distinctly better than the NJ shape. Now, the results of these computer simulations were confirmed by a series of full-scale crash tests. So configuration F became known as the F shape. And even though the performance of the F shape was superior to the NJ shape performance, it was not widely used. This was because the states were well satisfied with the NJ shape, which also met the crash test data. So in addition, their contractors did not want to change profiles because they had a considerable investment in the forms required to produce the NJ shape. Now, as I showed before, in figure one, the slopes of the F shape and the NJ shape are the same. The major, the major difference between the two is that the distance from the ground to the slope break point of the F shape is 255 millimeters 
which is 75 millimeters lower than the NJ shape. Now, the lower slope break point significantly reduced the lifting of the vehicle and greatly improved the performance of the concrete barrier. Now, again, the NJ shape and the F shape profiles are closely related. Now, if you make a 75 millimeter asphalt overlay next to the NJ shape and mentally cut a new 75 millimeter reveal in the concrete that remains above the asphalt surface, you have converted the NJ shape into the F shape. What happens is, or what does this mean? It means that the asphalt resurfacing can work actually convert the NJ shape into a safer design. Again, this means that the asphalt resurfacing work can actually convert the NJ shape into a safer design. Now, however, these asphalt overlays will reduce the overall height of the concrete barrier and consequently reduce its effectiveness for heavier vehicles. So, here's what's happening here. When a single truck, such as a rider or U-Haul rental truck, hits a concrete barrier in a crash test, it rolls toward the barrier until the underside of the truck bed comes to rest on the top of the barrier. This stops the roll motion. Then the vehicle slides along the top of the barrier until it is redirected up front. So for this to occur, the concrete barrier must have a minimum height of 32 inches. So to retain and redirect an 18-wheeler or tractor trailer in a crash test, a concrete barrier must have a minimum height of 42 inches. Now, in these collisions with trucks, the primary load path is vertical because the load is transferred from the underside of the truck bed or trailer to the top of the concrete barrier. So a concrete barrier again, is essentially a short, stocky com column. It's a short, stocky column. Again, with this short, stocky column, it can easily resist vertical loads. So again, a concrete barrier is essentially a short, stocky column that can easily resist these vertical loads. Now, besides trucks, buses, and other heavier vehicles that tend to slide along the tops of concrete barriers. It is important to keep the tops of these barriers free of signs, fences, and luminaire supports and other appurtenances, appurtenances that could snag the vehicle and cause it to yaw. That's a pertinence. That's a pertinence. That's what that is. It keeps other appurtenances that could snag the vehicle and cause it to yaw. Now, when it is necessary to provide luminaire supports on concrete barriers, the barriers can be made thicker at the top of the vicinity of luminaire support and flared out on the sides to provide a smooth lateral transition section for the impacting vehicle. Now, what is a luminaire support? We deal with luminaires, we deal with lighting. And generally, see some concrete barriers like I've gone into Illinois. They got luminaires right on top of the barriers on uh, I-94 and I-294, the Illinois tollway. You also see some of them on I-65. Now, they also have high-performance concrete safety shape barriers. Now, the high concrete barriers are sometimes used as truck barriers and to provide an integral glare screen on concrete medium barriers. Now, the deck of the tractor trailer is located about 53 inches above the ground because the deck is strong, stiff, structural member. Remember, the deck is a strong, stiff structural member that can produce significant lateral forces when it impacts a concrete barrier. Therefore, any concrete barrier that is higher than 52 inches 
should have some reinforcement near its top, if only to prevent spalling concrete from flying into oncoming traffic. Now, some states have slip form concrete flare screens on the top of existing concrete barriers. Usually the concrete glare screens contain some reinforcement to prevent spalling. Now, the NJTA, which is the New Jersey Turnpike Authority, has crash tested and developed a 42 inch high concrete medium barrier that can, that can safely contain and redirect traffic trailers to an upright position. Now, this barrier is made with the NJ shape forms. Now, the 75 millimeter vertical reveal is covered up with asphalt to anchor the barrier against overturning. Now, this turns the barrier profile into an F shape that does not have a vertical reveal. So, basically, the NJTA's heavy vehicle medium barrier, 12 inches thick at the top, it is heavily reinforced. Now the Ontario tall wall is a 1070 millimeter high concrete median barrier with the same profile, but with no reinforcing. Now our crash test with a 36,000 kilogram, which is 80,000 pound tractor trailer at 53 miles per hour and an impact angle of 15 degrees demonstrated that the Reinforcing was not necessary because the Ontario tall wall is 305 millimeters at the top. So even though concrete shrinkage cracks form vertically approximately every eight to 11 feet and penetrated completely through the cross section of the barrier, the cross sectional area and the aggregate interlock were sufficient to transfer all of the impact forces. And the impact forces were lateral impact forces across the cracked sections. Now, the 75 millimeter thick asphalt overlays that anchored both sides of these high performance medium barriers did not separate from the concrete during the crash test with tractor trailers. So other crash tests have shown that one inch thick asphalt overlays on both sides, 32 inches high concrete medium barriers are sufficient to anchor them for impacts with passenger cars and buses. So remember something about barrier. It's got to be approved by the FHWA and your state DOTs. And today, many states use the concrete safety shape barriers that are only six to eight inches thick at the top. Tractor trailers can break off a V-shaped piece of concrete at the construction joints and climb on the top of these barriers. However, this is such a rare occurrence that most states do not find it economically feasible to use thicker barriers or to increase reinforcement in the vicinity of the joints. Now, gasoline tanker semi-trailers do not have any exposed structural elements between the wheels and the tank, which is centered about 78 inches above the ground. In other words, here's what I'm saying. There is nothing for the barrier to push on between the wheels and the tank. So the 1070 millimeter wheels can interact with a 1070 millimeter high concrete barrier and direct the vehicle in shallow angle impacts. However, to contain and redirect a 36,000 kilogram gasoline tanker after impacts at higher angles and speeds of 90 inches. In other words, let me round this out. Basically, when you have a, a gasoline tanker, it can the barrier can redirect a 36,000 kilogram gasoline tanker after it, it impacts the concrete barrier at higher angles and speeds. And we're talking about when that happens, a 90 inch concrete barrier is required. Now, something else I'm going to get into, I've mentioned about parapets. They're on bridges. They operate the same way as Jersey barriers. 
So when a concrete safety shape lifts a vehicle, some of the kinetic energy of the vehicle is converted into potential energy. And what I mean by potential energy, you have kinetic energy and potential energy. Basically, kinetic energy is energy in motion, whereas potential energy is energy stored. So basically, the potential energy is turned back into the kinetic energy as the vehicle returns to the ground. So basically, vertical concrete parapet walls do not have this energy management feature, but crash tests have demonstrated that they can perform acceptably as traffic barriers. Why? Because all of the energy absorption and an impact with a rigid vertical wall is due to crushing of the vehicle. Bumpers usually do not slide up vertical concrete walls and lift the vehicle. So all four tires tend to stay on the ground because this minimizes the potential for vehicle rollover because the vehicle is not lifted and tilted by the concrete vertical face. This also increases the possibility of a motorist head-on collision through a side window and contacting the vertical barrier. Now, when it comes to wheels, vehicle wheels are primarily designed to handle vertical loads, not horizontal loads. So the trajectories of passenger cars after crashing into vertical concrete barriers can be uncertain because of the wheel damage that can occur when the front axle con uh, contacts the barrier. And here's what the, the constant slope concrete barrier looks like. Now the need to have a single slope barrier profile that is more consistent performance than the vertical face concrete wall led to the development of constant slope barriers. So both constant slope barriers and vertical concrete walls can facilitate resurfacing because their performance is insensitive to the thickness of the asphalt overlay. And this is particularly advantageous when constructing barriers on curved ramps for resurfacing operations that otherwise would require resetting concrete safety shape barriers. So up to 10 inches of overlay can be made before the, con before the barrier height is reduced to 32 inches. Again, up to 10 inches of overlay, and we're talking about pavement overlay can be made before the barrier height is reduced to 32 inches. And remember, the barrier height is 42 inches. So that's roughly three and a half feet, almost four feet off the ground. Now the Texas constant slope barrier, which is 42 inches high and has a constant slope base that makes an angle of 10.8 degrees with respect to the vertical. What it was originally tested and developed for use as a temporary concrete barrier, but it has been widely used as a permanent concrete median barrier. California developed a constant slope profile that makes an angle of 9.1 degrees with respect to the vertical. So this is closer to a six degree slope on the upper faces of the NJ shape and the F shape. Now, California has used this constant slope profile for their 1070 millimeter high type 60 roadside barrier and for their type 70 bridge rail. Now the crash test indicated that the performance of Texas constant slope barrier is compatible to that of the NJ shape and the performance of the California constant slope barrier is also compatible to the F shape. Now these constant slope barriers have both been tested along with the 18,000 pound single truck in accordance with Inchert Report 350 and they are both test level four barriers. To date, constant slope barriers have not been crash tested with tractor trailers or other heavy vehicles. Therefore, their upper performance limits have not been established. Now there are also portable concrete barriers. Now these are the ones that the contractors use 
when they're out there constructing a the road. They put them up, they put them down. Now, these are known as PCBs. Now, they have greatly improved safety in construction work zones. PCBs are made of precast concrete safety shape sections. They're joined together to, to basically form a continuous longitudinal barrier because portable concrete barriers are primarily intended to keep errant video of vehicles from hitting concrete or hitting construction workers. Now, again, the PCBs, just to go over it again, they're, they're portable and they're basically used to keep errant vehicles from hitting construction workers while they're working, particularly in the median, if they're adding a lane or if they're putting on the shoulder because the dynamic lateral deflection of these barriers must be kept to a minimum. So in general, barrier deflection can be minimized by using longer barrier segments and by using joints that can develop a bending moment of 50 kips per feet. Now, what is a kip? I'll tell you what a kip is. This is a, a unit that is used in structural engineering. It's known as a kilopound. So when somebody says a thousand pounds, well, a thousand pounds equal one kip. Now here's what the barrier looks like. See the pickup truck. Now, also, as we continue, pen and loop connections are very popular because they can be readily accommodating for with because of the horizontal curvature and changes. In vertical grade. However, they can only develop bending moment capacity after the joint has undergone a significant amount of rotation. So a washer or cotter pin at the bottom end of the steel pin is necessary to prevent the pin from jumping vertically out of the loops upon impact. So loops made of reinforcing bars are better than wire loops because they can resist torsional rotations of the barriers at the joints. So when it comes time to pull the barrier segments tight, well, they can uh, they they can be anchored to the ground with with bolts, uh, particularly the aluminum barriers. So as I continue pulling barrier segments tight and anchoring the end segments to the ground, they're very helpful in reducing the lateral deflection. Anchoring each segment of the barrier with steel pins driven into the ground is very effective, but again, somebody has to get paid to do that work, and it is very labor intensive, and it makes the barrier less portable. Low profile concrete barriers. Now, if a sloping face on a concrete barrier can lift a vehicle, then it stands to reason that a slope in the reverse direction can tend to hold the vehicle down by pushing the bumper downward. So basically, a 20 inch high portable concrete barrier has been developed by the Texas Department of Transportation for use in work zones and intersections in which driver's sight distance would be blocked by a higher barrier. So the reverse slope is 2.8 degrees or one in 20 with respect to the vertical. So this low profile concrete barrier was successfully, was successfully crash tested with a pickup truck at 45 miles per hour, it has not been tested at higher speeds with large, larger vehicles. Now, in conclusion, each of these concrete barrier types fills a niche and it helps the needs of highway agencies that align, uh, that select design and locate traffic barriers. Again, you have many bar barrier types, just like I talked about the guardrail. So each of these barrier types builds a niche 
in the market, and it also helps the needs of highway DOTs that select, design, and locate traffic barriers. So in terms of safety performance, the 42-inch F-shape is currently the best technology so far. F-shape profile is clearly superior to the NJ shape and is gradually being used by more states for both portable concrete barriers and permanent concrete barriers. And if you want to know more about the author, his name is Charles F. Devet. He's a structural engineer in the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Safety Research and Development at the Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center in McLean, Virginia. He has 39 years of experience in designing, testing, and developing new products he joined the FHWA back in 78 and for the last two decades. He has worked on developing new and improved traffic barriers. He has a master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Pennsylvania, and he is a registered professional engineer in the state of Pennsylvania. And what I'm going to do is leave the link to this information at the bottom of my video. Now, again, what I've been doing in these past two videos, I've talked about safety. There are a lot of collisions that happen, and I know about the concrete barriers. Back in uh, three years ago, I was coming back from Indianapolis, and at mile marker 154 on I-65 northbound, I was driving and I ran into one of these concrete barriers and these were temporary concrete barriers. And what happened, I ricocheted right off the concrete barrier and went one third of the way down the, the hill. Now, nothing happened to me, but the car was damaged. But what I'm saying is, now had that barrier not been there, I would have gone down there into the, the, the ditch. But these barriers, had somebody been working back there, nothing would have happened to them. And it's it's very important that you understand that these barriers, just like guardrail, they're to keep they, they are to keep your car, particularly the barriers, since they have a curved surface, they're to keep your car from rolling over. And also they're to keep your car because there's no median. Now I know. The Pennsylvania Turnpike, when I was younger, I used to travel it. They used to have a guardrail. You had the, you had the road, north, uh, eastbound and westbound. Well, they took that guardrail out, and they put Jersey Barrier. That Jersey Barrier, what it does, it keeps traffic in one direction from head-on collisions with traffic and going in the opposite direction. And again, I believe in safety. Most of us are drivers. And one thing when it comes to uh, greater populations, a lot of us like to drive. Some of us are careless out there. So there are apparatuses out there that keep us safe. Again, I talked about the ET plus attenuators, that's guardrail. Well, in construction zones, you have the PCB, the portable concrete barriers. You have the F-shaped concrete barriers. You have the Texas constant concrete barriers. Uh, you just heard me mention about the gentleman, structural engineer. And, I, and I've been to the um, center that's where they do a lot of the fhwa does a lot of testing of materials and, and crash testing right there in virginia and if you are in the civil engineering particularly if you go to uh, george mason university or howard university any of those universities that have civil engineering university of dc right in that area i would Definitely take the opportunity to visit the um, 
the highway testing center in, in that area of Virginia. Because uh, you get into testing of precast beams, everything. These are all of the concrete materials, all of the bituminous materials that are used for transportation. But it's important that you understand in chirp 350. You'll hear that term as well. But again, what I did tonight is give you an overview on the purpose of concrete barriers. And that concludes this topic. And if you like what I just presented, please comment, share, and subscribe. And if you're looking for some political and some social content, check out my main channel, the 411 Talk Zone Radio Show Channel. Now, after I record videos on both of these channels, the 411 Talk Zone and the QCIS channel, I then upload the videos to Twitter. Now, for the QCIS channel, since it is an educational channel, I will also upload the content to my LinkedIn page. And in the end, thank you all for joining me as I talk about the purpose of concrete barrier right here on the QCIS channel. And on this channel, you get a daily dose science, technology, engineering, and math. Until next time, my name is Leon Jones. Would you all have a wonderful, gracious evening.